Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to this significant gathering as we come together to mark the International Day for Poverty Alleviation. Today, we stand united in our commitment to address one of the most pressing challenges of our time. And it's a day to reflect on our shared responsibility and to take meaningful steps towards a world where everyone has an opportunity to thrive. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your dedication and for joining us in this important mission. Before we get started, I would like to show you a very quick video of CFC, the work that we do and the impact that we create. Thank you very much. I would like to present you the video. That was our video with a special thanks to our intern who has done a terrific job on making that a success. The video gives us a very short um, overview of the contribution we make as an impact investor in SMEs. SMEs are the missing middle and that largely go unfunded when it comes to poverty alleviation, zero hunger, gender, et cetera, et cetera. And the CFC makes a considerable contribution to this missing middle so that others can crowd in and scale the impact that we seek to achieve. Now, as part of our mission today uh, for the International Poverty Day, I would like to give the microphone to our Managing Director, Ambassador Bilal, who will speak on the subject of poverty eradication, and he will introduce our esteemed guests for today. Over to you, Mr. Bilal. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Thank you. Excellency Rabin Balde Singh, Madam Ratnaji, Excellency Castro, Excellencies, Distinguished Governors, Alternates, Executive Directors, Alternate, uh, my dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Allow me to welcome you all to our webinar to celebrate the International Day for the Education of Poverty. This year marks the 30th anniversary of the International Day for the Eradication of Poverty, designated by the United Nations to raise awareness about the urgent need to eliminate poverty globally. Let me quote from Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations, Amina J. Muhammad. I quote, imagine for a moment the pain of a mother 
who cannot feed her newborn daughter with the proper food she needs to live beyond the age of five. Imagine the mother who toils all day in the field, but still goes to bed with a stomach aching from hunger because she cannot afford enough food to feed her family, unquote. Ladies and gentlemen, there's hardly anyone who has experienced a situation of a person, a neighbor, something like that. And if you haven't experienced, then you are lucky. But still, this is all of our job to see that no one remains that poor, that hungry. And this webinar, if it has any purpose, is to see that we can do together something so that we can have as less as possible if we cannot eradicate it. Poverty, my dear friends, is indeed a complex and multidimensional concept that can be defined in various ways. Generally, poverty refers to a state of deprivation where individuals or communities lack the resources and means necessary to meet their basic needs and enjoy a minimum standard of living considered acceptable within their society. And the theme of this year is putting dignity in practice for all. We consider it a, it's a, as a call to action that emphasizes the importance of respecting and upholding the inherent dignity of every individual, regardless of their background, identity, and circumstances. Dignity, therefore, is not a vague concept. It applies to each and every person. Regrettably, many people enduring persistent poverty face disrespect and the denial of their dignity. This is particularly evident in the case of a smallholder farmers who continue to live in impoverished conditions. The treatment of individuals living in poverty serves as a measure of how societies uphold the value of human dignity. Globally, there are approximately 500 million smallholder households representing over 2.5 billion vulnerable individuals who face the volatility of commodity prices. The struggles of smallholders persist regardless of whether prices rise or fall, making their livelihoods precarious. Despite discussions about sustainability, the world's heavy dependence on commodities has increased. Antart's report reveals that the number of commodity dependent countries rose instead of decreasing from 93 to 101 between 2008 and 2009 and, and 2018 and 2019. Commodity dependency exposes countries to negative economic shocks, impacting export and fiscal revenues and hindering economic development. The root of this dependency lies in the powerlessness of smallholders within the value chain. They often lack control and dignity, acting as a price takers while, while others profit. A smallholders endure financial losses even when commodity prices rise. Their plight reflects a significant blind spot in the marketplace that must be addressed through alignment between the farm gate price that farmers receive and the final price that you and I pay as a consumer. By exploring investment models and understanding the struggles of smallholders at the beginning of the value chain, CFC has been working for a technology-enabled transformation in the value chain. Our work, therefore, is intended to be liberating the smallholders from poverty and reducing their dependency on commodities. CFC believes in practicing what it preaches. We want to leave trails where others can pick up. Integrated programs that focus on the commodity value chains have shown promising results 
in promoting dignity and eradicating poverty. One such example, as you can see on the screen, is, is a LIV program, a sustainability initiative in the coffee value chain led by the Common Fund and Markan Coffee Group. LIFT operates on three pillars, profit, planet, and people, aiming to support farmers in growing high quality coffee while ensuring their livelihoods and environmental benefits from these activities. Through this LIFT index, farmers are assessed based on 18 practices with a focus on eliminating child labor, discrimination, and promoting fair labor conditions, and ultimately increasing their income. As you can see, their income rose by 355%. See, FC's commitment to closing the poverty gap extends to its efforts in empowering marginalized communities in its 101 member countries. By identifying those who are left behind and understanding the underlying causes of poverty, collective intelligence and co-creation of solutions are utilized. The story of empowering women in the macadamia and art business exemplifies CFC's dedication to enabling farmers, particularly women, to improve their incomes and build resilient livelihoods. Our investment in the organic palm oil in Sierra Leone is expected to bring back 70% of the final value of the organic palm oil back to the country of origin. We urge you, whoever listening now or will listen afterwards, CFC is especially keen on working on those commodity value chains that will help bringing higher share of the income back to the smallholders who work so hard to produce it for us. The programs and investment of CFC emphasizes the importance of putting people at the center of development. By promoting sustainable development within planetary boundaries, these initiatives aim to create a world where commodities work for both the producers and consumers, fostering prosperity, peace, and dignity for all. We know our challenges are of Himalayan proportion. So are our resolve to make poverty a subject of the museum. Humanity has enormous resources under its command. We just need to use them with foresight. We can face both the challenges of poverty, eco ecological cataclysm due to climate changes and hunger. Every two years, we have spent 2.4% of the global GDP on food that go into waste. Every year, we spend $500 billion for fuel subsidies. This is precisely the amount the Secretary General of the United Nations asked from the G20 as additional amount to implement SDGs. Tax evasion by the wealthy corporations is estimated to store around 10% of the global GDP. At 2022 level of 85 trillion GDP, we are talking about trillions here. Some new taxes, money is there collecting taxes, slashing subsidies and tax evasions. We need international resolve and will to make a difference. With limited time remaining until 2030, it is imperative that we work tirelessly to ensure that no one is left behind. Development with dignity means and means creating a society where every individual can lead a decent, rewarding life in a safe and healthy environment, and more importantly, with dignity, respect, and esteem each and every human being deserves. I thank you. Distinguished uh, participants, now it's my pleasure to introduce you our keynote speaker. Mr. Ravin Mald Singh. He has been a trail village, trail village since 1975, when he arrived in the Netherlands from his native Suriname, alone at the age of 13. His family immigrated there two generations earlier as laborers from Hindustan in what was then British India. 
After the abolition of slavery in 1863, there was an urgent need for labor in Suriname. In the period from 1873 to 1916, more than 34,000 people immigrated from British India to Suriname to work on the plantations as indentured laborers. He has spent his teenage years in Leiden, going to secondary school and washing dishes in a restaurant at weekends. When he turned 18, he moved to The Hague, which was by then a multicultural city. His political career began in 1986, when Mr. Ravin joined the Labour Party. In 1988, he was elected to the city council and would have spent the next two decades in local politics. Since 2006, Mr. Balde Singh has served as deputy mayor of the city of The Hague, the Netherlands, the international city of peace and justice. He was The Hague's elder man for social affairs, employment, neighborhood approach, integration policies, and sports. During his 12 years as an elder man, he had the experience of working with responsibility for some of the most deprived communities in the Netherlands. On October 15, 2021, Mr. Ravin Balde Singh was appointed by the Dutch government as the national coordinator against discrimination and racism at the Ministry of Interior and Kingdom Relations of the Kingdom of the Netherlands. The national coordinator against discrimination and racism NCDR is taxed with bonding and bridging, boosting policy efforts and overseeing their implementation. The NCDR engages in dialogue with society, organizations, and the ministries involved. The NCDR continues to place the topics of discrimination and racism on the government agenda and to hold up a mirror to society. The NCDR sees, sees to it that the aims of the national programs are achieved. Mr. Balde Singh has been a born fighter against all kinds of discrimination and racism on all grounds. He has been a lifelong foot soldier of equality for everyone in the European and Caribbean Netherlands. Ladies and gentlemen, our keynote speaker, Mr. Robin Balde Singh. Excellency, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Bilal, uh, Your Excellency. Uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Your Excellencies, uh, great to be here uh, in this webinar, and thank you very much for the CFC to having me here today uh, to focus a little bit on this uh, beautiful day, uh, which is the uh, day, of course, of the alleviation of poverty in the world. But since I have been appointed, indeed, as a government commissioner in the role of national coordinator against discrimination and racism, I would like to focus a little bit on my job and how I am dealing with uh, exclusion in society, and then I'll come up to uh, the poverty aspect, uh, surely. Um, as mentioned before, indeed, from October 2021, now two years uh, ago, um, I, uh, I started uh, uh, my office, actually, in The Hague as an advisor, special advisor to the government um, uh, as national coordinator against discrimination and racism. And, my main task is indeed to bring together civil society and the government uh, together. Um, uh, there is a great gap between civil society and government in the Netherlands right now, and to address, of course, discrimination and racism in society. And I see myself actually as a connector, as somebody who is bonding and bridging, actually, and also as a driving force. And if it must be, then I indeed am a watchdog uh, in developments relating the elimination of discrimination and racism. Um, what the role is, is actually uh, to, uh, to make, uh, together with five ministries, and that concerns, that's the concern of actually seven uh, ministers in this country, an annual program consisting of policy reinforcements uh, and uh, monitoring the, their implementation. So I am in the process right now to make my second national program. I'm going to submit that to the Council of Ministers uh, at the end of this year in December, on, uh, on, December uh, on December 11th. 
And that means that um, once uh, the Council of Ministers uh, uh, has uh, agreed, you know, uh, in accepting the, the national program, then it will be submitted to the, 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 the Houses of Parliament, the first and the second chamber, and it will also be submitted to the European Union as the uh, uh, member state action, national action plan of the Kingdom of the Netherlands. And to make to be able to make this national action plan, I organize regularly meetings, for example, with local grassroots organizations, and of course, this annual uh, uh, conference, which I have to put every year. Uh, to focus on my work, uh, uh, and that's the next slide, please, uh, is, of course, the First Amendment, the first article of the Constitution of the United States. And that's a very powerful statement which is being made in this article, and that says that all persons in the Netherlands shall be treated equally in all in equal circumstances, and that discrimination on the grounds of religion, belief, political opinion, race, disability, sexual orientation, or any other grounds whatsoever shall not be permitted. So this is actually an act, an, uh, uh, an amendment in our constitution, which uh, which which puts equality uh, and, and equity forward. So that's very important because that is my compass, you might say. Um, um, now, uh, but still, of course, in the Netherlands, you will be finding discrimination and racism. Now, let's focus a little bit on the next slide, indeed, the discriminatory aspect. So, you know, discrimination and racism are two separate things. Discrimination is in, you might say, in act, the way you act, and racism is the way you think. So, uh, so thinking and acting are, are here uh, as two separate things. So that means that discrimination refers to the situation where one person is treated less favorable than the other, um, has been or would be treated in a comparable situation on grounds of uh, racial or ethnic origin, sex, gender, religion, or belief, sexual identity, disability, age, or any other grounds. And that means also, as far as I'm concerned, a regional aspect. So, uh, 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 so that means the way we treat people uh, living not in the West, for example, or for example in Africa or Asia or any other parts of the world. So you see that in uh, it's it's uh, it is treated. People are treated less favorable, um, also on the basis of uh, the region they are living in. Racism, however, refers to theories and ideas and opinions or a series of conscious or unconscious acts, behaviors, or expressions, which express superiority, rather, of a particular group over another uh, on grounds of origin, skin color, and religion. So this is very applicable, for example, for the United Nations, um, uh, a decade of people of African descent, which is absolutely based, of course, uh, uh, on uh, yeah, the grounds of origin, but also the basis of color in which uh, uh, many people or many countries make decisions. So this is actually the vehicle I am uh, uh, I have started with, and I'm focusing on you know to bring equality in in this case in the Netherlands. But of course, I have to uh, uh, operate not only here in the Netherlands, but I have to operate actually with best practices in the world, but I have to inspire also uh, uh, not only uh, organizations or even the Netherlands as a whole, but also the European Union and I hope, of course, other partners in the world. And that means that the sustainable development goals of the United Nations is a very interesting thing. So, of course, uh, 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 dear participants, you know what the de uh, sustainable development goals are. There are 70, uh, uh, 17, and if you look at the 17 SDGs, they are really interconnected. It is really thought very thoroughly uh, uh, to, to, to get this interconnection. Uh, they require uh, governments, uh, businesses, and civil society to take concerted actions, actually, to provide our world with a better present and a sustainable future. So indeed, the present situation is important, but we are focusing, of course, of the world of tomorrow. Uh, how do we want to, uh, to, 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 uh, to create that world and to be able to create that world? And Ambassador Bilal 
uh, talked about it, you have to uplift people. So you have to push people gently into a lift, into an elevator, you know, to come uh, a, a storage, uh, a story higher, you might say, than the current position. So that is really uh, important uh, to mention. So that means that the goals must translate this shared vision into a national development plan and strategies. And for today, I wanted to emphasize uh, on three things. So that is the re uh, reducing poverty, so alleviation of poverty. I wanted to focus on the reduction of inequality and because that is also the main area uh, uh, of my work as the Dutch National Coordinator Against Discrimination and Racism. And the, the two specific goals are the SDC 5, gender equality, uh, which is very important also in the region you're working with. Um, I mean, obviously in Africa and other uh, uh, low development uh, countries. And of course, SDG 10 uh, uh, reduced inequality. But that doesn't mean that I'm not going to uh, focus a little bit on uh, SDG 1, because I think it is interlinked with the other two goals. Um, uh, so, so, so my job is indeed to focus here in the Netherlands not so much so internationally as uh, it is your work, but parallels can be drawn to the position of people elsewhere in the world, and I'm sure. So let's focus, uh, dear friends, on SDG 5 first. So SDG 5, uh, achieve gender equality and empower of women and girls, which is indeed uh, uh, stipulated by the United Nations uh, uh, very uh, thoroughly. And if you focus a little on that, then you see that gender equality is not only a fundamental human right, but uh, it is a necessary a foundation for a peaceful, for a prosperous, and for a sustainable world. Um, there has been progress over the last decade, but the world is not on track to achieve a gender equality by 2030. And I'm very troubled uh, with this conclusion, you might say, because I think their uh, work has to be done because, as you'll see on the next slide, women and girls represent uh, half of the world's uh, population and therefore half of its potential. But gender inequality persists uh, everywhere and stagnates social progress because women and girls are an integral part of this social progress. Without them, social progress will not be achieved. And that means that we have to get rid of, for example, sexual violence and exploitation, uh, the unequal division of unpaid care and domestic work, and discrimination in public offices. Uh, these are really huge barriers, and we have to get rid of it. Otherwise, it's going to be difficult uh, to include everybody. And recent UN reports, the gender snapshot 2023 sounds um, alarm bells um, uh, uh, for women worldwide. So, so the snapshot 23 warns that um, if current trends continue, over 340 million women and girls, an estimate of 8% of the world's female population will live in extreme poverty by 2023, 20, and mind you, that is in seven years' time, right? So it's not far away from us. It is, it is just uh, uh, around the corner. And close to one in four of the women will experience moderate or severe flood insecurity. So the gender gap in power and leadership position remain entrenched. And at the current rate of progress, the next generation of women will sp uh, still spend an average of 2.3 more hours per day on unpaid care or on domestic work than men will do. So you hear, you see the inequality uh, 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 from a, not only a Dutch perspective, but also from a uh, world perspective, and I'm really very troubled by this. And if we focus more to the SDG 10, as far as reducing uh, inequality is concerned. Now, then you see uh, that, you know, we have to act to, because there is inequality. So not, let's not discuss whether there is inequality or not. It is. I mean, look at around you, look at the world, and then you will see that there is inequality. So it's not uh, uh, whether it is there or not, but why 
uh, do we need to reduce it? Why do we need to add? So inequality based on income, on sex, on age, on disability, sexual orientation, race, class, ethnicity, religion, and opportunity continues to persist across the world. So inequality threatens a long time, long-term social and economic developments, um, harms poverty reduction, and destroys people's sense of fulfillment and self-worth. Uh, this in turn can breed crime disease and environmental degradation. So what we're talking about, we're not talking about poverty, huh? Looking at this SDG, T, SDG, uh, SDG, we're not talking about poverty, we're talking about human rights. It is a fundamental human right, you know, to have an equal position uh, in your region or in your country uh, between men and women, but also between countries uh, uh, of this world. We have only one planet. We have decided to, uh, divided it in several uh, 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 countries, but there's one race and that's the human race. We are the human race. And that doesn't mean that you're, I am superior to you. So I have put you in a position where you're not uh, where, where I'm not superior to you, but I've put you in a place where, you know, I have organized a, a, a situation where you uh, are in a poverty position. And it's, it's my responsibility, you know, to, 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 to care and to share. And I'm going to come to that uh, in, uh, uh, shortly. So we cannot achieve sustainable development and make the planet better for all if people are excluded from uh, uh, the chance for a better life. Everybody in this world has the right to have that chance. So one in six people worldwide have experienced discrimination in some form with women and people with disabilities disproportionately affected. So mind you, discrimination is worldwide on the basis of all the grounds I've mentioned previously. But if you look at women, if you look at people, uh, uh, disabled people, then they are affected disproportionately. And the year 2022 witnessed the highest number of refugees, uh, uh, 34.6 million people ever documented. And, there, and this year is also, uh, yeah, the deadliest year uh, for migrants, for example, and you've seen all the pictures, you know, in the Mediterranean Sea, what, what's going on. So the question is, how do we tackle discrimination? What do we have to do? In today's world, we are all interconnected, surely. Problems and challenges like poverty, like climate change, migration, or economic crisis are never just confined to one country or region. So if you look at the migration aspects, there is a pull, push factor. And the push factor can be poverty, for example. The social uh, injustice created by others, created by other countries in the region where they come from, but also climate change. If you look at climate change, who is affected the most? Are we in the West affected the most? I don't believe so. I think that people in Africa, people in Asia, uh, South America, you know, in, in Oceania, so in those parts of the world are more affected, uh, affected uh, than, uh, 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 than we are. I mean, the floods in, what is it, in Pakistan uh, some time back. I mean, it was really terrible what happened there. Um, it is because of climate change. Um, uh, so I think we have to be very conscious on the fact that problems and challenges like this, um, and also the economic crises, are not confined to one country or region, but we are, uh, it is interlinked, and that means that we are responsible. And even the richest countries still have communities living in abject poverty. I don't know whether you're familiar with the Netherlands, the situation in the Netherlands. I mean, one of the richest countries in the world. But because of uh, you know, uh, the economic crisis which we're facing, the financial crisis, the energy crisis which we're facing right now, because of, also of the war on the Balkan, et cetera, 
you know, uh, the poverty has increased in the Netherlands. On one, one million people are, uh, 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 in, uh, uh, yeah, are in poverty right now. So, of course, this government has taken now measures. Uh, 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 we'll spend two billion uh, uh, euros, you know, to 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 act uh, and to see whether they they can be uplifted. But even uh, in the West, you know, these things are happening because we are not facing these kind of challenges, but because look, we are looking the other way. So the oldest democracies still rest, wrestle with racism, with homophobia, with transphobia, and religious intolerance. And global inequality affects of all, no matter who we are and where we come from. And what can we do then? Uh, I think it is important uh, to reduce inequality. And reducing inequality requires transformative change, uh, greater efforts, uh, uh, sorry, greater uh, efforts are needed to eradicate extreme poverty and hunger and invest more in health and education and social uh, protection and in, you know, decent jobs, especially for young people, for migrants, for refugees and other vulnerable com communities. So within countries, it is important to empower and to promote inclusive social and economic growth. And that means that you have to share. It's not I, it's not me, it's we. And I think we have to stress more on the we side than on the I side. So we can ensure equal opportunities and reduce inequalities of income if we eliminate discriminatory laws, policies, and practices. Mind you, discriminatory laws, that's in the boundaries of one, one country, you might say, but policies and practices are not only confined to the country's border. I mean, policies, uh, uh, international policies, European policies, uh, uh, you know, affects the policy of others, other countries far away from here. And that goes also for practices, practices by governments, but also practices of businesses multinationals, etc., because these practices uh, 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 do not uh, include these practices, uh, you know, make you stay in the deprived position where you have been put in the first place by others. And I think it's not the law only, it's the policy, it's the practices which we have to tackle. Um, some observations in the Netherlands, let, let, you know, to compare and to come to the point uh, I'm making worldwide. You know, if you look at SDG 5, then you will be seeing that women are underrepresented in higher position in employment and in government. In the Netherlands, wages are still 13% less than men. In the Netherlands, wow. the percentage of women in higher education, women falls behind under EU member states. That's a fact. The number of female parliamentarians is below the EU average. That's a fact. Sexual and physical violence against men, uh, women still high. So these are observations uh, in the Netherlands. Inequality in payment, for example. No equal labor participation is still in place. The report is experienced with discrimination. Uh, so, 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 so you see that in 2001, 10% of the population have experienced discrimination on the grounds of skin color, national origin, sexual orientation, or belief. Um, in the Netherlands, 10%, and that's a huge percentage. So this is what is in place right now in the Netherlands. And if you extrapolate this you know, to uh, other countries or even on a, a world perspective, then I'm sure, actually I'm positive that this facts which I am uh, uh, submitting to you right now, the participants, of this great webinar, uh, I'm sure that this is applicable also uh, for uh, other parts of the world, parts of the world which has the attention of the CFC uh, uh, very much. And uh, uh, so if you look, if I can conclude, then you'll be seeing that poverty and belonging to a minority are interconnected, as are poverty and gender. So it's, 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 a, it's a holistic approach which is needed here, in my humble opinion. 
income inequalities exist in the Netherlands and in the world, and the gap is becoming smaller, but it's getting smaller because of, I mean, organizations like CFC, which are very much focusing on the small, uh, you know, what is it, businesses, very small businesses, you know, uh, to uplift people uh, in, with the philosophy that if you uplift one, with that you uplift the whole family. And if the family is uplifted, you're uplifting more families. And if more families in a village uh, are uplifted, then you're uplifting the whole village. So that is the philosophy which is uh, 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 close to my heart, I must say, but it is important. But but then we have to realize, realize that to do this, reduce, uh, reducing discrimination and racism is a strong driver to reducing in, uh, equalities as a whole, income equality, but also you know the inequality which has been created, uh, uh, you know historically uh, with several legions. So the SDG five and SDG ten helps to raise awareness and require governments, businesses, and civil society to take action. Same goes for SDG one, yeah, tackling the poverty. Uh, uh, we have a long way to go, and as a yeah, what is it? Connector, you might say. Um, uh, that is what I tend to believe that my position is in this in the Netherlands. A go-between, a uh, yeah, a, a someone, an institution who tries to bond and to bridge uh, uh, between civil society on the one hand and the government on the other. I see it as my challenge to address these issues, uh, uh, which I have done and where possible, I will act as a connector and when necessary, I will act also as your watchdog. And in that position, I would like to do a couple of suggestions. So the possible ideas to move further. You know, what has happened, uh, you know, in the, what is it, the last decade or two perhaps, is that the North-South dialogue uh, is not of any importance anymore, as it seems. It used to be in the 70s, um, of the last century or even in the 80s, but then it declined um, uh, because protection, uh, you know, yeah, the West first came into account. So that meant that, you know, people protected themselves, people, uh, countries protected themselves rather. So you saw that protectionism is there. Uh, the solidarity on which the world was, you know, based a little bit to help each other is gone. Uh, you know, the Netherlands used to have um, an X percentage of its GDP, you know, which was uh, uh, put as development uh, aid. It's no longer there. So, uh, so the whole discussion on, uh, we're talking about, of course, uh, the world powers. We're talking about the companies uh, which have uh, world power. Uh, we're looking at China, India, America, United States, the West, uh, you name it. But we forget to look at, you know, the northern side of the world and the southern part of the world. So this north-south dialogue um, have to be implemented again, uh, Ambassador. Uh, and in my humble opinion, the BRICS uh, countries can play a leading role in this. Uh, uh, of course, also the private sector. So I think that, you know, some uh, multinationals could uh, play a role in it, but it's not their... Um, uh, yeah, it's not their core business because, you know, they want to uh, 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 earn money, on the other hand. But I think perhaps the BRICS can be leading in it. At least that's my humble wish. And I would like to, uh, 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 yeah, I would like to be focal on this. And I hope that uh, this can help. Uh, another thing which is of importance, but that is uh, indeed what you're doing is this microfinance. It's a success story, right? So we have to be focal on it. We have to be focal on it and try to see whether we can inspire other organizations, other countries, you know, to invest in this. So because microfinance is making a difference in Bangladesh, for example, in, uh, in India, in African countries, for example, even in the, in, the, in the Middle East. So if that's a success, why should we be, be very humble in it? So let's invest, invest more. So that is what I would like to uh, push uh, uh, further. Um, and of course, I think still enhancing development cooperation 
is important. So I think we have to put on the political agenda that an X percentage of the GDP of countries uh, uh, has to be uh, uh, yeah, reserved you know, for food and nutrition security in the world, climate change, of course, commodity on the other side, and empowerment, and especially empowerment of women. Women uh, who uh, are so of great importance as far as uh, peace and, and development in countries uh, are concerned. So uh, I would like to be very focal on that. And I think that the key question in this is, can the Netherlands, for example, but talking about the Netherlands, I think it means the European Union in this case, can they play a key role in this process? Um, uh, and I think we have to focus, we have to try to, uh, to lobby on this aspect. And I'm very much uh, attend to uh, be your uh, uh, support in this, because I think we need to move, uh, we need to create political support. You know, the world has become polarized. Even the Netherlands, the polarization is huge. So that means that it is difficult to get support for cer certain agenda points. And I think this is one which is of great importance. And we need to talk. We need to bring, we need to make, build bridges. But we need to, we need to create a coalition of the willing um, and not a coalition of the willing by textbook. So, yeah, that's important. So let's. No, we have to act. We have to act. So how can we bring politics and, and countries together to act? And I think it would be imperative for us to see whether um, we could do something about uh, this aspect. So talking about this combination, but also on these three uh, SDGs, I would uh, very much like to be a partner of CFC um, on the European level, actually, to bring uh, uh, bring partners together to create a kind of coalition of the willing. So if it's suitable for you people, you know, to, um, uh, to also not only invest and, and, you know, and create possibilities, uh, small possibilities for people, you know, to, uh, to uplift them, but also to get, uh, you know, you know, poverty and, and the, the challenges these people face is also in the minds and the hearts of the people in the West, then we need to create that coalition of the willing. And I can, I can, uh, I mean, let's see whether we can walk together this path because it is a important. Uh, so dear friends, uh, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I think uh, that the SDGs, which has been uh, 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 designated by the United Nations, it's an important uh, uh, focus point, but also an inspirational focus point. But uh, my uh, uh, outcry will be: let's not leave it to letters, you know, written, uh, uh, you know, in textbook. Uh, but let's use these letters uh, to act, and by acting, let's try to make uh, a difference. Let's try to make a difference for many, many, many people in the world, you know, and. The only difference we can make is by up, by not discriminating them, by including them in the process of development, and indeed, uh, if necessary, by helping them literally, you know, to bring them to a lift, you know, to get a floor higher. And that is the main purpose. And I hope that this day, October 17th, 17th not only marks um, uh, the uh, uh, alleviation of poverty, as a remarkable day, but that uh, October 17th inspires us not only today, but the year, you know, every day uh, in a year, you know, to make a difference for, for these people and by making a difference for these people to make a difference for us and to make a difference of this beautiful planet. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you, Excellency. Thank you. Uh, I just uh, wish I have uh, enough time to kind of follow up on the first few of the things that you brought forward and that touched our heart, this issue of uh, this core SDG, SDG 1, SDG 5, and SDG 10 is also the core part of us. And this concept of this North-South dialogue that we cannot just emphasize it more and the importance of finance. Um, I wish uh, we can have more uh, time to have uh, follow-up discussions. I seek the indulgence of the distinguished participants uh, for some flexibility on the time as 
uh, we have very important uh, even more speakers uh, we have uh, before us. Uh, now it is my uh, absolute pleasure to introduce His Excellency Mr. Uh, Arnoldo Barnes Castro, the Ambassador of Costa Rica to the Kingdom of the Netherlands and permanent representative to the OPCW and CFC. Uh, by, by training a lawyer and notary, Ambassador Castro has an extensive experience and a special interest in human rights. International public law, international relations, international security, fight against terrorism, democracy, peace, philosophy, and com compared religion. Ambassador Castro has served the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Costa Rica in various distinguished assignments. His Excellency is also a member of the Permanent Court of Arbitration, Institute uh, Hispano Luso Americano de Derecho International, and the Swain Military uh, Hospitaller Order of St. John Jerusalem of Rhodes at Malta. For us in the CFC, Excellency Castro also known with an added esteem and appreciation as he comes from a country where good governance and innovation made commodities work for their people in ways that has been huge inspiration for a good many people in the region and beyond. In terms of international poverty line, less than 2% of Costa Ricans are considered impoverished and impressive accomplishments. So we'd like to gain from your experience, Excellency, and also for Costa Rica's success. Over to you, Excellency Castro. Thank you so much, uh, Ambassador Belal, for, for your kind words. Um, Mr. Um, Rabin Baldesing, um, it's also a great honor to, 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 to be with you and dear participants, uh, good afternoon to, to everybody. Uh, some days ago, the, the CFC Managing Director, Ambassador Belal, I myself, we were commenting that in our multilateral work here at The Hague, rightly called the City of Peace and Justice, we focus mostly on issues of international law. We have three international courts here, plus the Hague Conference on Private International Law, plus the OPCW dealing with um, disarmament. But we do not deal much with uh, other issues such as the fight against poverty. It made me reflect that, um, at least in my case, probably, the CFC is the only multilateral organization that I work with here in the Netherlands that tackles issues dealing with the fight against poverty. Of course, it makes sense that there is some sort of specialization in our multilateral work. What we must not forget that all issues are interconnected at some level. Ambassador Belal kindly invited me to, to take part in this event with some brief reflections on the nexus between human rights, dignity, and poverty something which I am very honored to do. As we know, every 17th of October, the International Day for the Eradication of Poverty is celebrated with the aim to promote understanding and dialogue between people living in poverty and the wider society. This year's theme is decent work and social protection, putting dignity in practice for all. As is explained in the United Nations official webpage on this day, this year's theme, and I'm, I'm quoting um, what, the, what the page says, calls for universal access to decent work and social protection as a means to uphold human dignity for all people and to emphasize that decent work must empower people, provide fair wages and safe working conditions, and fundamentally recognize the inherent value and humanity of all workers. Similarly, Universal social protection is urgently needed to guarantee income security for everyone, prioritizing society's most vulnerable members. The theme is also a call to political leaders and policymakers to use human dignity as the guiding compass in all decision-making processes to ensure the advancement of fun fundamental human rights and social justice over the pursuit of corporate benefits." End of quote. Therefore, by focusing on human dignity as the guiding compass, this year's International Day for the Eradication of Poverty creates an inevitable link with human rights, in particular economic and social rights. This leads us to a human rights-based approach to poverty, through which we must recognize that poverty is not merely an economic issue or the absence of income, but a violation of fundamental human rights. Indeed, we must recall that the normative basis for human rights lies in what we call human dignity. 
It is so established in the first article of the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights, when it says that all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. The preamble of the 1966 International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights and the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights also state this premise when they recognize that, I quote, these rights derive from the inherent dignity of the human person. From the idea of this inherent dignity of all human beings, we derive the three main characteristics of human rights. They are universal, equal, and inalienable, meaning that they appertain to all human beings just because they are human, that they should be enjoyed equally by all without any form of discrimination, and that they cannot be denied or alienated on the risk of depriving someone of their humanity or dignity. However, to say that human rights are rooted in the individual's intrinsic human dignity leads us to the basic question of what should we understand by human dignity? Of course, different societies and cultures may validly have been have different understandings of what a dignified life is. And this in the past has been used to support arguments of cultural relativism to put into question the universality of the idea of human rights. But insofar as the international community has drafted and adopted some core human rights, some core human rights instruments, the catalog of human rights contained therein serves to define a minimum common understanding of what are the necessary conditions for all human beings to enjoy a dignified life. Therefore, we must accept that currently there is international consensus on the fact that human rights are necessary conditions for the inherent dignity of all human beings to be respected, while those rights at the same time serve to define that dignity. We frequently make the distinction between civil and political rights on the one hand and economic, social, and cultural rights on the other. And this is reflected in the fact that the two subsets of human rights are contained in two separate but parallel instruments, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, both from 1966. In broad terms, it is considered that civil and political rights and liberties, such as freedom of conscience, of speech, of assembly, etc., imply a more passive role from the state, which generally would only be required to abstain from interfering with those liberties, while economic and social rights, including the right to an adequate standard of life, which in turn includes the right to adequate food, to adequate housing, to education, to health, to social security, to water and sanitation, and to work, among others, require a more active role from the state, which must create the conditions for those rights to be enjoyed, for example, by building schools, hospitals, creating social welfare programs, and so on. Since not all countries possess the same resources for this, and because uh, there is a, legal, a basic legal principle that says that no one is obliged to do what it cannot do, the outcome is that the economic and social rights are considered as programmatic. Indeed, Article 2 of the Economic and Social Social and Cultural Rights Covenant establishes that each state party to the present covenant undertakes to take steps to the maximum of its available resources with a view to achieving progressively the full realization of the rights recognized in the present covenant. This word in contrast with a much stronger obligation stated in Article 2 of the Civil and Political Covenant, which establishes state's responsibilities to respect and to ensure to all individuals within its territory and subject to its jurisdiction the rights recognized in the present covenant. In spite of this distinction, it is generally accepted that all human rights are interdependent. For example, what good is it if citizens enjoy the right to vote freely, but they are starving or lack education? Conversely, what good is it if people have their basic needs related to housing met if they do not enjoy freedom of expression? These are all conditions for a dignified life. Therefore, all human rights must be seen as complementing each other, that is, as an indivisible unity. Precisely, this is the focus of the Sustainable Development Goals, which, as has been explained, comprising 17 global goals, provide a universal roadmap to address by 2030 pressing global challenges, including poverty and inequality. Indeed, almost half of the SDGs relate to economic and social rights. SDG 1 explicit aims to end poverty. SDG 2 establishes the goal of ending hunger, achieve food security, and improve nutrition, promote sustainable agriculture. SDG 3 addresses the need for good health and well-being. SDG 4 emphasizes quality education, which is perhaps the most powerful tool for empowering individuals 
and breaking the cycle of poverty. SDG 5, focus on gender equality, achieving gender equality and empowering women economic and socially is not only an end in itself, but also a means to reduce poverty. SDG 6 refers to the need to ensure availability and sustainable management of water and sanitation for all. SDG 7 focuses on ensuring access to affordable, reliable, sustainable, and modern energy for all. And finally, SDG 8 aims to promote sustained, inclusive, and sustainable economic growth, full and productive employment, and decent work for all. As happens with human rights, uh, SDGs are therefore also interconnected. Progress in one area has positive impacts in others. As mentioned earlier, economic and social rights have a somewhat less enforceable status due to their dependence on the availability of economic resources to ensure their protection. And that is why innovative initiatives are required to create conditions for the people themselves to generate what is needed to eliminate poverty. The main challenge for every state and society then is to create the conditions so that all people can earn a decent living and prosper through their dignified work, including their own businesses. And this is where the work of the CFC plays a critical role in this complex landscape as an intergovernmental financial institution created to support commodity dependent developing countries with a mission to enhance the socioeconomic development of its member countries through the promotion of sustainable commodity based development. Ambassador Belal, uh, Mr. Rabin Valdesing, and uh, also through the video that was shown at the, um, at the beginning, uh, we have, um, have already explained how the, the work of the CFC uh, contributes to uh, achieving SD, SDGs and alleviating poverty and protecting human rights. So I will skip this, this part uh, on, the, uh, on the sake of time. But uh, just to, to conclude, um, uh, from the previous reflections, we can surely conclude that the, the fight against poverty is intrinsically linked to human rights and the sustainable development goals. That poverty is a violation of human dignity and human rights, and that the SDGs provide a roadmap to address these issues comprehensively. So it is only appropriate that this event to commemorate the International Day of the, for the Eradication of Poverty has been organized by an organization like the Common Fund for Commodities that actually does contribute to alleviating poverty. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ambassador and uh, people in the conference room are clapping for your <laughs> speech. <laughs> It's time for Q&A and I would like to have uh, a question. Uh, well, I'll, I'll start with one question for Mr. Rabin. There's a lot of discussion online on the difference between equal opportunities and equal outcomes, particularly when it comes to, for example, gender in, in the Netherlands. Um, and I would be very curious to hear your take on this as the as the, 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 the focal point for uh, anti-discrimination here in the Netherlands. Over to yeah. You. yeah, so that the question is uh, quite difficult uh, to answer because, uh, um, um, as I as I as I mentioned, you know, uh, e equality uh, uh, and is is a very important thing, you know, which we want to uh, to gain in this country. So that means that if you want to have an equal society, so get rid of inequality then um, all who form that society has to have a, a fair share, you might say. So that, that means also for women. Um, so you see, you see on certain uh, levels, um, they don't get the equal opportunities and the payment is, of course, uh, an important one. So the outcome should be, you know, uh, and that's why I started uh, my whole presentation with Article 1 of the Constitution, we have to uplift to that Constitution. And that means that everybody in the same circumstances get the same uh, uh, opportunities. And that's not the case. And that's why we speak of discrimination. So um, uh, my task is you know, not only to observe that, but my task is to indeed uh, formulate all kinds of action points you know, to get rid of that inequality. And I'm in that process right now. So if you're asking me what will be the outcome, yeah, the long-term outcome, I hope to get rid of the inequalities, but I'm sure that I will not succeed in, in getting rid of this equal inequality within a year, for example. It will take a time because, you know, uh, establishing this inequality uh, has, yeah, what is it? It's an inequality of uh, a century plus, huh? so you cannot get rid of it uh, 
uh, with a uh, yeah. yeah. So it will take time. Thank you very much for your con contribution, Mr. Ramin. I have a question for uh, His Excellency, uh, Mr. Castro. Um, you speak on behalf of, of Costa Rica, who in, in certain objects has done extremely well, particularly for its region in terms of sustainable development, for example, energy, etc. Now that we're unfortunately facing several compounding risks, climate change, humanitarian uh, issues, um, et cetera, financial risks, et cetera, what could we learn from Costa Rica that we could potentially implement on a global scale in terms of um, advancing the sustainable development goals? Well, thank you for, for the question. Um, well, I think, uh, of course, each country has its own uh, development path. So what works for one country may not necessarily uh, work for others. So what I can, I can perhaps explain very briefly a uh, couple of things that perhaps made a difference for Costa Rica. Uh, in 1948, following a civil war, Costa Rica abolished its armed forces. And that, uh, that's very interesting, the, the, what happened afterwards, because uh, uh, in, I think from my conclusion is that also served not only to uh, um, create a, a more peaceful and safe environment um, uh, regarding its uh, its neighbors and internally, but it also strengthened the, the rule of law. So um, uh, the Costa Rican mind frame there there is a I would say a great deal of respect for for the law, uh, division of uh, powers, and um, um, that has also made that. Um, the, there's uh, we, the system was was uh, let's say created and strengthened where there is a certain degree of confidence uh, in the in the mm -hmm. in, in the state, and also of course that that means that uh, those who, who who hold the power have an, an obligation to to act uh, uh, accordingly, but also um, that has been reflected in a commitment to to protect the environment, and uh, through a combination of um, in a um, a system of national uh, for uh, park, national parks, uh, private reserves, uh, uh, wildlife reserves, plus a program to promote uh, conservation of forests through a fund that was set up with a percentage of from the fuel. Every time someone purchases fuel, there's um, a, a small percentage that goes to feed a fund that uh, goes to an, an institution that um, signs contracts with the um, landowners to, um, to, to for them to receive a small amount, not that, that high, um, every year for each hectare of forest they protect. So that allowed Costa Rica not only to reverse its uh, deforestation rate, but but to um, actually increase its tree coverage from twenty six percent to about fifty four percent in in some years. So right now about fifty four percent of the of the country has its tree cover uh, intact. So uh, also 25% um, of, the, of the country is, uh, is protected, the territory one way or another. So I think it uh, uh, has to do with, um, with the culture, uh, a respect for the, for the rules-based system. Mm -hmm. I, I would say, I will extrapolate that to the international rules, rule-based uh, system. Uh, and also a, a, a deep commitment to, to democracy, to, to environmental protection, to and social, social welfare. Okay, that's a very thoughtful answer. Thank you very much for that. Okay, that means that we can open the floor to our audience in case there are any questions. Please do leave a message and then I can ask on your behalf or you can unmic and then you could ask yourself. Are there any questions from our audience? Going once going twice <laughs> sold <laughs> uh, there are no more questions i want to thank our esteemed guest for joining us today from far and from close by um this is this is it for today and we hope to see you again soon thank you very much you may leave the zoom session thank you very thank much you all. Thank, thank you thank you Thank you. If you have any questions, we're still open. <laughs> <laughs> I can stay here for a while longer. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We all have to work together. And thank yeah, you, yeah. Yeah. No, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Excellency. Yeah.
Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thank you. I, I enjoyed this very much. And uh, thank you, Ambassador Bilal, once again. And um, uh, Mr. Baldessing, uh, really. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, See, you Hague. See you in the Hague. See you in the Hague. Yes, I'm looking forward to, to seeing you in person. Uh, yeah, here right. and, uh, and, and also to Fatima, thank you so much for, for My pleasure. Um, moderating and so well this, uh, we be this, this event. Thank you very much. And thank you for your contribution. It was very apt. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Well, how, how would, if I wanted to speak, what would you have done? Because I, I asked him. She was left. She was left. Mr. Machumo, your microphone is on. You <laughs> can speak. No, yeah. Just to add no. my voice to Ambassador Bilal, thank you very much. Oh, we have man. followed thank up the you. presentation. It was quite enlightening. It's uh, all points uh, very relevant. I, I don't, I don't any, I don't have anything to add to. But uh, you know, if we could collaborate in the points that uh, were raised, it would be quite uh, pertinent and timely. Just to express my gratitude. Thank, thank you, you Ambassador Bilal. From Ethiopia, in the Brussels and. We have to see our former managing director, Ambassador Ali Mochomo. Hello, Mr. Mochomo. Hello, Ambassador Bilal. How are you? Very nice to hear you. And I want to use this opportunity to congratulate you and commend you for organizing this event uh, uh, regarding uh, a day, International Day for the Poverty Eradication. This is very commendable on your part. And indeed, uh, this is what uh, CFC should be doing to highlight the challenge of uh, fighting poverty globally, uh, which is one of the fundamental principles why uh, the organization was established. So I want to just commend you. Uh, and uh, and uh, having left the organization almost over a decade ago, <coughs> I still follow what is happening uh, in, in the CFC. And I, I really am impressed by what you, are, you have been doing uh, in, in, the, in, in terms of uh, making sure that uh, community-dependent countries and people uh, get a fair share uh, in, the, in the economic uh, gains uh, of your work. So I want just to wanted to commend you and also to commend Mr. Mr. Rabin and for his contribution and his uh, address, and also Ambassador Castro. For making such a, a good contribution to the discussion, I just wanted to uh, to to indicate that, of course, uh, uh, poverty eradication, as you have already indicated, is one of the major global challenge global challenges facing humanity, uh, and that indeed it constitutes the first uh, among the uh, 17 uh, SDGs. Uh, poverty eradication is uh, is uh, is uh, uh, number one, and so it is a major challenge which all of us. Uh, should uh, should address and uh, this should not be just left to governments but it should be uh, done by all uh, organizations which which uh, can organize people to make sure that uh, whatever is possible is done to make sure that there is uh, there is the upliftment of the lives of the people in uh, in terms of uh, what we uh, now that I'm with INBA which is the, the international bamboo and rattan organization which was established in 19, 1997, uh, one of the major goals of, of this organization is to in, indeed to, to eradicate poverty among the member states uh, that, uh, that we, we have in our organization. Uh, we started off with nine member countries, now we are 50 countries, and uh, all, of, all, of, all of them are countries in the developing world, global south, and that's where poverty is uh, is most pronounced. So I just wanted to say that uh, we really appreciate uh, uh, the need to address this issue and we want to commend the CFC uh, in the assisting uh, in, by, in doing exactly that. And we have on a record that between the year 2003 up and 2016, uh, CFC has been able to contribute uh, a lot of, money, of funding uh, in assisting uh, in uh, to eradicate poverty through uh, the development of bamboo uh, in developing countries and almost uh, projects worth of 10 million dollars have been uh, assisted through the funding that we obtained from CFC from CFC so I just wanted to make sure to just to indicate that we are, we appreciate what uh, what CFC continues to do 
and we hope that it will be able uh, to, to achieve more success as time goes on. Of course, when we celebrate and we mark this day, it is, it's important to, to uh, address the issue uh, how far uh, we have uh, progressed in achieving uh, this challenge of eradicating poverty. And as Mr. Ambassador Bela himself has said, uh, much has been done, but still there's a long way to go before we are able to really declare, declare success on the question of, of poverty eradication. But there are some cases which are worth noting. Some countries like China, as you know, has made a tremendous progress in uplifting millions of people from poverty over the last few years. And uh, through bamboo, uh, which is one of the major uh, items in the uh, in the fight of, uh, against uh, poverty in, in China, through bamboo, uh, about 10 million people have been assisted to, to be lifted out of poverty in China. And uh, this is something which we hope other countries uh, can, 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 uh, can uh, follow the example of China in how to, uh, to, to, uh, to go down to the, to the, to the grassroots. And, and assist people to, to fight poverty through uh, uh, products or communities like, uh, like, uh, like, uh, like bamboo. Of course, uh, 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 what has been done in China is something which needs to be, uh, to be uh, uh, studied or learned by other people so that uh, we can achieve uh, uh, this uh, important uh, uh, challenge uh, before 2030, which is the target date for eradicating or eliminating poverty in the global south. So I wanted to take this opportunity, Mr. Mr. Chair, Mr. Uh, Mr. Managing Director of CFC, to commend you and also to commend uh, the leadership of the Netherlands also in hosting that organization and making, make, making it possible for it to provide services to the global south. Uh, with these few words, I want to once again to commend you for organizing this uh, event and I hope it will be possible when we celebrate or we mark this day next year we shall be able to, to record some more progress made uh, in eradicating or reducing poverty in the global south. I thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Machumo. Great. I think we this makes us complete. And um, last but not least, we can complete the session right now if, if you do wish to do so. Thank you very much for coming and hope to see you again. Bye -bye. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Take care.